Okay, so delta function potential is an <coughs> extremely thin uh, potential. We'll both look at the cases when the potential is repulsive and attractive. Okay, so why are we interested in this? Well, there are two reasons. <coughs> One of them is that if you have a very thin potential barrier, something like this, and the wavelength is, so suppose this has a width of A, and your wavelength of the wave function is much larger than this width, this then may be approximated by a delta function. Okay, so if you have some with strength V0 and uh, the uh, thickness of the barrier is A, then you can approximate this. Okay, remember that the area under this is associated with the uh, strength of the delta function. So we are going to get something like A V0 times delta of X if this is at the origin. Okay, and this we'll see is a much easier problem to solve than that one. So it makes a good approximation if you have a very thin barrier or a very thin well, we are going to see the same effect. <coughs> we are going to get this uh, effect. And second, when we are working with the delta function, since this is a singular object, we'll see what singularities do to the wave function. And that will also enable us to understand somewhat better what boundary conditions we put on finite uh, barriers. Okay, so <coughs> let me just uh, start the general discussion. Suppose I have my <coughs> delta function barrier and I have what does what happens to the wave function? So I have minus h bar squared over 2m d squared dx squared u plus this delta function. Let's assume it has some strength alpha times delta x. Let's put the delta function at the origin. We can shift it any other place. At times u, okay, so this is now my potential times u is equal to e u. So I am interested in the wave function near this singularity, okay? So what happens to the derivatives, etc., of the wave function, the wave function itself, when uh, u is near the delta function? Okay, so the way to analyze these things is I just take the whole equation, both sides, okay, both sides of the equation. I integrate it from a little before the delta function, epsilon, to a little after the delta function, okay, times dx. Okay, so what is this going to give me? Okay, there are three terms. Let me just write them down. Minus h bar squared over 2m, integral d squared u dx squared dx from minus epsilon to plus epsilon. Okay, that's the first term. <coughs> plus, okay, alpha times minus epsilon to plus epsilon delta of x u dx, right, is equal to e u dx minus epsilon to epsilon. Okay, so let's look at each one of these terms one by one. This is 
integral of a derivative, right? So what do I get here? Okay, the u dx evaluated at the limits, right? Okay, so my, I get minus h bar squared over 2m du dx evaluated at epsilon and minus epsilon. How about this one? It's a delta function integral. Hmm? Yes, okay. okay, alpha times u at zero is equal to, what about this one? As epsilon goes to zero. As epsilon goes to zero, um, assuming u is um, assuming continuous enough, we have e times two times epsilon times. Um, yeah, okay, epsilon. we don't even need to have a continuity in u as long as it's not singular, okay? It may even have a step, although it's a very, very unusual delta function. But in any case, if I, integrated from minus epsilon to plus epsilon, the area under the curve is going to be zero, something right? Hmm? Oh, sorry. I said something okay. order of epsilon. Mm, okay, something of order epsilon, yes. So in the limit epsilon goes to zero, that's what I get. Okay, so let me move this to the right hand side and just write this down. So this gives me du dx at epsilon on the right hand side minus du dx okay at minus epsilon on the left hand side is equal to I forgot the two here two m alpha over uh, what h bar squared u at zero so this says that because I have such a singular potential I am going to get a break in the derivative of the wave function, okay? So this also tells us why we keep this derivative continuous whenever the potential changes, right? Because we looked at <coughs> other problems in which we said, okay, suppose the potential changes like a step or something. And then we said the wave function, we have to match the value of the wave function and also its derivative. Okay, so we have to do that. The derivative at a certain point has to be continuous unless you have a singularity, unless you have a delta function at that point. Okay, so that <coughs> just justifies the fact that we are using continuous derivatives. It also justifies the fact that we have to have the psi constant because if we don't have psi constant we are going to get okay abrupt changes in the derivative at the interface which we do not want okay there's no justification for that okay so you see the analysis of this delta function potential is actually also important because it tells us uh, that <coughs> the derivative of the uh, wave function, okay, uh, has to be continuous uh, as long as you don't have a delta function. If you do have a delta function, you have a discontinuity which is proportional to the size of the delta function, okay? It's proportional to alpha. Remember, alpha is the <coughs> magnitude of the uh, potential. Okay, any questions? Yes. Okay, this is a, <coughs> an integral of a function u, which is going to be some function of u, okay? So I have <coughs> some function of u, okay, some function of x, okay? <coughs> and I have a u of x. So I am integrating from minus epsilon to plus epsilon, okay? So it, it, can be anything, okay, it can even be discontinuous. <laughs> so when I integrate from minus epsilon to plus epsilon, I am finding the area under the curve, okay, it could also be negative. But as epsilon goes to zero, I have no area left, right? So as epsilon goes to zero, that goes to zero, all right? 
Other questions? All right. So now that we have that, let's just <laughs> go back to our problem and see what we can do. Okay. So if <coughs> if we have a repulsive potential, okay. So if you have a repulsive potential, which means okay, this v of x is equal to alpha delta of x uh, with alpha greater than zero, okay, a positive potential. So <coughs> I'm going to have something like this, okay, as a function of x, I have a delta function, okay, so this is my v of x, which is equal to alpha times delta of x, okay, potential is zero at all places, and <coughs> delta function at the origin. So now I'm going to look at the scattering problem, right? Since this is a repulsive potential, there's no way I can get a bound state out of this. So <coughs> here I start sending my particle in with some energy E. Okay, so it is the free particle solution over here. In fact, it's going to be the same energy free particle solution on the right hand side also, because the potential energy is zero over here and over there. Okay, so the kinetic energies are the same, which means I'm going to get the same type of solutions. Okay, so over here, I'm going to get what is a solution? A and equal to IKX. Okay. A e to the i k x, and something may be reflected, plus b e to the minus i k x. Okay, so this is for x less than zero. For x greater than zero, what do I have? Okay, c times e to the i k x. Okay, so this is the transmitted wave. Okay. Now I have to match the boundary conditions. Okay, so the boundary conditions <coughs> tell me that, okay, so the boundary condition tells me that the u function at zero minus or minus epsilon must be equal to u at zero plus. Okay, so this means this function at zero must be equal to that function at zero. A simple relation, which gives me a plus b is equal to c. Now the <coughs> derivative is no longer continuous. Okay, so this just tells me u at zero plus u prime at zero plus u prime at zero minus is going to be equal to that quantity, which is important, 2m alpha over h bar squared, 2m alpha over h bar squared times the value of the function, which is c. Okay, and now what is this on the left-hand side? Okay, so let's just rewrite this. ik is the derivative, right? <coughs> times a is what I have for the first term, minus ik times b is what I have for the second term. That must now be equal to 2m alpha over h bar squared c. Mm, yes, ik. Okay. Thank you. Okay, but no exponentials. Okay, the exponentials just go to one. Oh. It x equal to zero. Okay, so uh, this no no ik here. Yeah, I'm I sorry. Like There's no ik there. Okay, it's just this. Okay, it's just the magnitude of the wave function. All right, so let me just rewrite this again. So it's going to be a minus b is equal to 2m alpha, okay, i k 
k h bar squared c. OK, so again, this is a system of two equations, two unknowns, OK? A is not counted as an unknown. A is the <coughs> probability flux, which is associated with <coughs> the <coughs> boundary condition at x equal to minus infinity. And we are trying to determine everything in terms of uh, A. All right, so if I just add these two equations, what do I get? <coughs> I get 2a on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, I get 1 <coughs> plus uh, 2. OK, m alpha, please check my algebra, uh, i k h bar squared. Right? Times C. OK, so that's very nice. Now I know what C is. C is going to be equal to uh, 2A divided by 1 plus 2M alpha i k h bar squared. OK, let me move the a over here. OK, so c is just that. OK, please check my algebra. I may have missed a factor of 2 or something. That seems to be OK. Uh, yeah, in fact, I just missed. I, I have to divide this by. Yeah, let, let me just, yeah, OK, tell me. Um, we said that the 2m alpha over h bar squared times c is equal to the difference between the differentiation between, uh, with respect yeah. to sides. Then shouldn't it be uh, ik times c minus, uh, in parentheses, oh. ik a minus ik b? Oh, yes, OK, thank you. <coughs> that, that's correct. Sorry, I made a mistake. Let me just erase that. OK, so it's the derivative on the right, i k times c minus OK, i k a minus b is supposed to be equal to 2m alpha or h bar squared c, OK? So again, just <coughs> dividing by i k and moving things around, OK? So let me divide by minus i k so that I again get a minus b here is going to be equal to what? I divide it by minus i k. So on the right hand side, I'm going to get 2 m alpha or i k h bar. All right. What else? Uh, there will be minus i k, so this will be just 1. 1 c. OK, please check my algebra. So I just divide by minus i k, so that I get a minus b on the left hand side. So dividing by minus i k, I get minus c here, which goes as plus c to the right hand side. And I have this thing divided by minus i k, OK? h bar squared, yes, thank you. OK, now when we add these things together, OK? In fact, this is almost right. I told you I thought I missed a factor of 2. So this is going to be 2a on the left hand side when I add this equation and that equation. OK, 2a, b is cancel. And then c plus c is 2c. Then I have this, except that this is going to be a minus sign, right? OK, so the 2's cancel. 
and I have 1 minus n no 2 here. Okay? I think we are all right now. I have a question. Yes. Um, why can't be the main number difference in the um, outgoing way? Okay, because it's the same Schrodinger equation. Okay, so <coughs> we have the same E, and the Schrodinger equation is minus h bar squared over 2m d squared u dx squared plus vu is equal to e. Okay, so this is valid from x equal to minus infinity to plus infinity. And this delta function, okay, so this is alpha dx is only in the origin, okay? So plus and minus psi have the same type of solution. All right, now that I have found c, I have actually found the transmission coefficient, right? The transmission coefficient is going to be equal to, okay, keep writing these things just to emphasize that there is a, uh, this is just ratio of the probability currents, okay, so it's h bar k, magnitude of c squared, and h bar k, okay, magnitude of a squared. So in this case, since the uh, potential energy is zero on both sides, I am not going to get a change in the kinetic energy. So this is what I have. Okay, so the transmission coefficient is going to be the magnitude of this. Well, this is just, okay, one is easy. Magnitude of the denominator is there's a real and an imaginary term, so it's going to be 1 plus square of this, m squared, alpha squared, k squared, h bar to the fourth. All right, so this is what the transmission coefficient looks like. Okay, so you can obviously see that as k increases, you are going to get uh, higher and higher values of t, but we could try to relate this to the energy, right? Because <coughs> energy is what? Energy is h bar squared k squared over 2m. So h bar squared k squared is just 2me, right? So I can write that in 1. 1 plus, okay, in place of h bar squared k squared, I'm going to put 2me, and the rest of it is still there, so it's going to be m squared alpha squared divided by h bar squared, so one of the m's will cancel, and this is what we have, okay? So again, I can just sort of multiply everything by e, numerator and denominator, so that I get e plus m alpha squared divided by 2 h bar squared. All right, so what does that give me? Well, transmission as a function of energy is going to start linearly for small e, right? And it will have a maximum of 1 as e goes to infinity. So it's a very simple sort of stuff. Okay. So this is for a single delta function. Now, what you can do is you can design certain potentials. Okay, so as a function of x, you can put more than one delta function. Okay, so you can put in a delta function perhaps at the origin and then another one a little farther away, if you like, a third one, and you can adjust their strengths. So what happens is that by adjusting these things, 
you can have transmission coefficients which correspond to resonances and you can actually very selectively perhaps pick out certain electron wavelengths with certain energies. Okay, so these things uh, can be manufactured rather easily. Okay, so th the standard material for doing experiments with this is uh, gallium arsenide. So <coughs> what you do is you take a crystal of gallium arsenide. So you have this nice material which has high mobility for the electron and then you dope it okay so you have a region here so I have gallium arsenide here again and here this is okay instead of having a ratio one to one uh, you replace one of these things I forget which one if one of them is x aluminum is one minus x okay arsenide so this is called L gas and this is a material which has a higher energy and you can adjust how much higher energy by adjusting the aluminum concentration in that region. So as a, the potential actually looks very low in this gallium arsenide, okay, becomes high and then becomes low again. So effectively you can make these things very thin, okay. So you just generate potentials as a function of x, which look very much like delta functions, okay? And you can <coughs> just play around with these things so that you get uh, various types of effects mm, uh, associated with these things, okay? So th th these things are usually called barrier diodes uh, and they switch extremely fast uh, with their use. Any questions? All right, <coughs> so let's now look at the problem of the uh, attractive potential. Okay, so suppose I now have alpha a negative quantity. Yes. Um, in this case, potential does not affect anything. I can understand hmm. what's the difference. Why the potential is generating. If you don't have the potential, you have one transmission equal to one, right? The potential, okay, so the potential is coming in through this alpha. Okay, so alpha is the magnitude of the delta function. So if alpha is very large, you see transmission is going to be less. Okay, for the same energy, for the fixed energy, larger alpha means we are going to have a smaller transmission. Okay, but again, if you increase the energy sufficiently, you are going to get even something higher. So you can get a family of curves here, okay, which look like this. Okay, so this is going to be low alpha, <coughs> no, high alpha, because then you have low transmission uh, and low alpha will give you that. Okay, so depending on what alpha is, <coughs> you are going to get a different curve. All right, other questions? Yes. If we have two large potential potentials, would we have bound states between them? No, uh, if you have repulsive uh, potentials, okay. So <coughs> if you have repulsive potentials, you can never get a bound state. Why? Because bound state means you need a negative energy, okay? okay? So there's no place where the particle can be. But <coughs> you can have long living states, okay? So if you solve the time dependent equation, you'll see that if you put a particle here, okay? So if you put an initial psi zero, psi x zero, which is not an eigenfunction of the uh, Hamiltonian, this, if these delta functions are sufficiently strong, this will leak out very slowly. So the time dependence 
is going to be very slow, okay, but such a state at, at best we can call a metastable state, okay, as we wait longer and longer, uh, it's going to, okay, you, are, you have, because you have these propagating waves, which is taking the probability away from you, so eventually the probability in the middle is going to go to zero, okay? <coughs> now, if we have an attractive, okay, okay, delta function potential, okay, then our V of x is something like minus alpha delta of x. All right, so our potential again, let's see what this is. Okay, so at x equal to zero, I have a minus alpha delta x potential. And I could, again, look at scattering solutions. Okay, so I could look at the scattering solutions. Those are, will, those will correspond to E greater than zero. Okay, and you can go through the algebra again, solve for the transmission coefficient, but let me give you a hint about what you are going to get. You see the transmission coefficient here is a, is proportional to alpha squared. So you are going to get the same transmission coefficient with a minus alpha, okay? So an attractive potential will actually give you the same type of transmission, okay? Because you have, you don't have a barrier, but now you have a well, which also affects how the particle moves. So for a very strong alpha, which means a very strong attractive potential here, again, you are going to get somewhat less of a transmission but again, if you increase your energy more and more, then you are going to get, again, transmission going to one, okay? So the scattering problem is exactly the same, not exactly the same, in place of alpha, you have minus alpha, but if you go through the algebra, the, the end result is proportional to alpha squared anyway, so you get the same thing, okay? Now, the interesting case here is when I am looking for a bound state. Okay, so bound state means I have a negative energy. Okay, so suppose I have energy minus E where E is positive. Okay, and now I'll try to see what energies are allowed because whenever I have a bound state, remember the fact that I have to match the boundary conditions uh, limits the energy to certain values. Okay, so let's see what the, yes. E is positive, but there's a minus sign in front of it, okay? So the energy is minus E, okay? All right, so I have this structure. Now, what does the solution look like? Over here where potential is zero. Okay, so if I'm away from the delta function, I just have a negative energy state. So what do I get for the for the wave function? Decaying hmm? Okay, I, I should get decaying exponentials. The exponentials which decay into infinity. Okay, so I should get some exponential which goes like this, and on this side, I need an exponential which goes like that. Okay, so over here, I'm going to get some a e to the minus capital Kx. What is this capital K? Okay, we know how to handle these things now. It's going to be 2m minus e, so that I get a positive number over h bar squared, right? So that's my value of k. On this side, I can have something like b e to the plus kx. 
But you see the boundary condition says these things must reach the same point here. Okay, well, let's just go through it step by step. So th those are the form of the wave functions. Now, the boundary condition uh, at x equal to 0, <coughs> which says u at 0 minus should be equal to u at 0 plus, is in this case very simple. It just says a is equal to b. And that's something that we expect, OK? We expect a nice symmetric solution here. Right? The delta function itself is symmetric. So the solution should also be symmetric. So if I put x equal to minus x, I should be getting the same thing, right? OK, so that's that. Now, the other boundary condition, OK? This time, I don't want to make a mistake. So you be careful and check my algebra plus u prime 0 minus is equal to, OK, what was it? 2m alpha over h bar squared, but now alpha is negative, so it's going to be minus 2m alpha over h bar squared uh, u at 0. OK, so the derivative of this function at x equal to 0 is what? a times minus k, right? It has a negative derivative. Minus the derivative over here is going to be k times b. But a is equal to b, so let me, I might as well use that. OK, so a times k. OK? Is equal to minus 2m alpha over h bar squared, value of the function at a, it's x equal to 0, which is a. <coughs> OK, so you see the these coefficients canceled. So for a bound state problem, I cannot determine this a. How do I determine this a? Normalization. Yes, by normalization, right? So <coughs> we are, this is going to work for any multiplicative constant. The uh, Schrodinger equation will be satisfied for any value of a, <coughs> but I am just interested in a normalized bound state problem. So <coughs> minus sign over here, minus sign over there. So if I just cancel the minus signs, I get k equal to m alpha over h bar squared. <coughs> okay. So now I know what k is. And since I know what k is, I know the bound state energy. OK, so this tells me that uh, energy is equal to minus h bar squared k squared over 2m. <coughs> I'm sorry, there's just one h bar here. OK, so you see. I get a single solution for this delta function. Yes. Is that the exercise? If you simplify E, it's positive. Why would we have minus E inside the loop? OK, well, <coughs> E, the energy is negative, and energy is equal to minus E, OK? OK, so I. I, I well, uh, OK, E itself, uh, E is positive, right? So that minus E is negative. OK? Uh, so, well, OK, so you're right. Maybe I should put it like this. OK, but the energy of the state, OK, so is minus this quantity. So I use the somewhat bad notation. OK, so this is the, <coughs> this is the binding energy of the uh, of the system. And you see there's just one solution. 
Now, if you <coughs> try to make this somewhat more complicated, okay. So, uh, if I have something like this, for example, it's zero, and say it's x equal to a, I have two attractive delta functions, okay, so minus alpha and minus alpha, they could be different, but just for Simplicity, let's look at the case when <coughs> these things are symmetric. Uh, <coughs> so what do I get? Well, <coughs> it turns out that I again get a solution which has exponentials over here. But now, since I have a nice symmetric case and in the middle here, I'm going to get Okay, some, oops, sorry, not really, because these things break the derivative, right? By reflex, I try to draw shapes with continuous derivatives, but this is what you have. <coughs> this is going to be a lower energy, okay? So this is going to correspond to the low energy state, so this is going to be the ground state, okay, but there will also be an excited state, okay, so this is going to be the excited state, okay, so this is the ground state, and you'll be able to find another solution, this time it will have a node in it, so it will come up like this, do something like this, I'll try to draw this somewhat prettier than this. Okay, so something like that, and then it will go to infinity. Okay, so uh, this is just going in the same direction. Okay, so this is going to be the excited state. This will have a somewhat higher energy. Okay, so just like the particle in a box problem, the lower energy is tend to have less number of nodes. Remember, for the particle in a box problem, the lowest energy state was something like this. Okay, the first excited state was had a one node in the middle. The next excited state had something like that, okay? So the number of nodes increase because Basically, the wavelength is decreasing, right? This has a long, this corresponds to a longer wavelength than this one. So as the wavelength decreases, you get more and more nodes in the problem. Now, it turns out that you can just find these two solutions. We get more number of solutions. We have to put in more delta functions, okay? <coughs> but this is the basic trend in all of this. Okay, uh, what else can happen? Well, obviously, the delta function potential can also appear in other problems. Okay, but <coughs> once you get to something somewhat more complicated than a single uh, delta function, you really get too many equations to solve and uh, the equations usually turn out to be transcendental. So you have to go to the computer to find uh, the solutions. Okay, I'm trying to still design a homework problem for you. You can find uh, solutions. Okay, uh, so just to give another example of what might happen, suppose you have a Okay, particle in a box problem, which we know how to solve. And now suppose I put in a delta function potential in the middle. Okay, so what happens? <coughs> now, you see this, when I put in a delta function potential, 
remember, okay, uh, unfortunately I erased my equation, but let me just try to write it here again. So u prime at zero plus, which means uh, if I choose this point that is my origin, <coughs> minus u prime at zero minus is going to be equal to what? Help me out, 2m alpha over h bar squared, right? Uh, times u0. Okay, so it results in a break in the derivative of the wave function, which is proportional to the size of the wave function there. So something like this will influence a wave function which is finite at that point to a large extent. So if I didn't have a delta function, I had something like this, right? But now, if I put in the delta function, it is going to result in a discontinuity in the derivative here. So I have to put that into the equation. Okay, the wave function is no longer going to be to have a continuous derivative here, but the derivative is going to have a change proportional to this. Now, on the other hand, if you look at, for example, the first excited state, it is going to be something like this, right? And you see the effect of this delta function. I can just say, well, there's this derivative, that derivative, and delta function is exactly there. So this is still a solution, OK? So for this one, since okay, u at 0 is 0, which means okay, delta function at that point has no effect. <clears throat> so this also tells you how modifying the potential is going to affect these states. So we are doing it with a delta function, which is going to be okay, uh, a very <coughs> harsh effect only at a single point. But you can also sort of see that even if it's not a delta function, but sort of a bump, it will affect the ground state much more than the first excited state, right? If the <coughs> wave function doesn't appear there in the first place, if you put, an, if you put some additional potential here, the wave function will not be influenced by that that much. Okay, so these are nice <coughs> points which I hope give you some intuition about what's going on. So <coughs> what happens here? Uh, you just uh, write down your equations, right? So <coughs> this is a equation between minus a over two to a over two. So for x less than zero, for example, <coughs> x less than zero, what do I get? <coughs> I get sine functions, right, which go to zero over here, sine or cosine functions. So let me just write the sine function, sine <coughs> pi over a, okay, uh, x minus a over 2, right? No. Uh, yeah, we have to be careful. For x less than 0, because I don't know the energy, sine k x minus a, OK? Is the form of the solution for x less than 0. For x greater than 0, it's going to be a similar function, OK? It's going to be <coughs> a, well, let's, let's keep it general, b sine k, say, over 2, x plus a over 2, right? So these are two sine functions which go to 0 at 
x equal to minus a over 2 and x equal to plus a over 2. So I put these things wrong. OK, so I'll get to try it somehow. So for x greater than 0, I have that. x less than 0, I have that. And <coughs> I also have a boundary condition, which says that in the middle, when x is equal to 0, I should get, OK, so at x equal to 0, if I have u at 0 minus, equal to u at 0 plus, what do I get? Minus a sine k a over 2 is equal to, no, at the 0, OK, in the middle. OK, it has a value. And on the right hand side, it's going to be b, what? K, yes, sine K A over 2. So that's very nice. This just tells me A is equal to minus B. Okay, that's again from symmetry. I expect something like that. But now <coughs> the other boundary condition, U prime at 0 plus minus U prime at 0 minus is equal to 2 M alpha over H bar squared U0. Now that's going to generate some interesting equation. So it's going to give me what? <coughs> k times cosine k uh, a over 2 minus k this is an A, this is a B, K cosine, again, K A over 2, OK, is equal to 2M alpha or H bar squared, any one of these, A sine K A over 2, OK, uh, which then gives me k times, OK, a is minus b, so 2k cosine k a over 2 is equal to 2m alpha h bar squared sine k a over 2. So you see, I get this equation, which now I have to solve for k. So if I solve this for k, I have found the energy of the system. Okay, But this is now a transcendental equation. right? You see, this gives me tangent of ka over 2 is equal to k. Okay, So there will be a family of solutions. So what this tells me is that if I divide by cosine, so it's going to be tangent ka over 2 is equal to uh, h bar squared k divided by m alpha. And I have to solve this equation. And if you remember how the tangent function behaves, OK, it's a function which goes something like this. OK, so this tangent function k is something like that. So each intersection here is a solution. OK, so you are going to get <coughs> a number of solutions, which is to be expected, right? So you are again going to get something which looks like this, and something like that, then something which, OK, has a break here, and like that. OK, so you are again going to get infinite number of <coughs> solutions. Just because you add this small delta function here doesn't, isn't going to change everything, OK? Uh, it's just going to change the energy levels a little bit, only the ones with even symmetry. OK, I guess I have kept you here more than I should. So I'll let you go. OK, I'll ask you to ring the break. <coughs>
not to break. Okay, so I'll see you guys on Thursday, right?